Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce my close friend and colleague, Dr. Jeremy Moore. Dr. Moore has bounced between coasts his whole life. He grew up in Southern California, where he attended UCSD for undergraduate. He then traveled to the East Coast to attend the Medical College of Virginia, came back to the West Coast to do his internship and the cardiology fellowship at UCLA, and then traveled back to the East Coast, where he trained at Vanderbilt under Frank Fish um, for advanced electrophysiology training. He returned to UCLA and joined our faculty in 2010, um, where he has been an integral part of our adult congenital program, particularly electrophysiology. He is also the co-chair of the Pediatric and Adult Congenital Electrophysiology Society's Committee on Research in Adult Congenital uh, Arrhythmias. Um, and for those wondering why I'm talking so fast, it's because he's going to cover electrical interventions in the failing Fontan in 15 minutes or less. <laughs> Dr. Moore. Okay, so I'd like to thank Dr. Shannon for the introduction. Dr. Shannon is the reason I went into EP in the first place, and uh, he's one of the best ACHD EPs I've ever come across, so I really appreciate the welcome. All right, so to jump right in, Fontan arrhythmia. So patients um, with Fontan uh, circulation are exposed to essentially the same kinds of rhythm disturbances that other patients with congenital heart disease are exposed to, the big difference being that they just don't tolerate these rhythm disturbances nearly to the same degree. And these are the four categories I'm gonna be talking about today, uh, and, and more, more or less for all of them. Sinus node dysfunction, atrial flutter, patient-induced cardiomyopathy, and sudden death. So uh, sinus node dysfunction, there's lots of reasons patients with Fontans uh, can develop sinus node dysfunction and include uh, the following, myocardial stretch and fibrosis, especially after lateral tunnel and atrial pulmonary Fontans, autonomic denervation from prior surgery, uh, manipulation near the cavoatrial junction where the sinus node lives, and uh, potential injury to the sinus node artery. And um, if you look at the data on prevalence and incidence of sinus node dysfunction in the Fontan population, it's estimated to be around 15%. Uh, the pie chart on the left there is from the Pediatric Heart Network study, cross-sectional study um, showing junctional rhythm in about 6% of patients and paced uh, rhythm in 9%, so a total of 15. And then the, the Kappa-Meyer curve on the right is from a recent meta-analysis by the Montreal group looking at all studies uh, of sinus node dysfunction in Fontan patients. And for the modern versions, the extracardiac Fontan, lateral tunnel Fontan, they found uh, an incidence of 15% or so at 10 years after surgery. So it's not uncommon. Why is this so important? Um, so for in normal sinus rhythm, normal physiology in the Fontan circulation, there is systolic flow predominance through the pulmonary venous system. Uh, as the, uh, essentially as the AV, during systole, as the AV valve is uh, drawn downward, there's a suction-like effect that draws blood into the left atrium, and you have a lot of the forward flow occurring at that time. When you're in junctional rhythm, uh, that systolic forward flow is lost. In fact, there's reversal of flow into the pulmonary veins as you have atrial contraction against a closed AV valve. And if you do invasive hemodynamics on these patients, uh, you see uh, very deleterious effects of junctional rhythm. So there's a, lot, the, there's a reversal of the pressure gradient between the pulmonary venous atrium and the Fontan uh, circulation during uh, systole, and Fontan pressures tend to be higher. When you apace the patients, that reversal, the forward flow is reestablished, and the Fontan pressures go down. And clinically, we see this uh, being relevant in, in patients uh, sometimes with PLE and other forms of um, uh, a Fontan failure, where um, significant sinus node dysfunction manifest as junctional bradycardia uh, can be a treatable, uh, uh, re a treatable sort of target for these patients. And after conventional therapy fails, there's some nice studies from you know, Mitch Cohen and colleagues back in 2001 showing that you can have reversal of uh, PLE with atrial pacing in that, situ in that particular situation. And that's been shown in other ser case series and uh, case reports since then. Uh, so how do we pace these patients if they need pacing? So the two major options are going to be surgical and transvenous. Uh, surgical uh, approach is really the conventional approach. The limitations are that the right side of the uh, pulmonary venous atrium tends to be densely scarred. Uh, there is a higher rate of lead failure in that situation. And so a lot of times you need to do left thoracotomy to get to viable atrial myocardium. Uh, some downsides include pain, prolonged hospital stay, and cost. Uh, the transvenous approach is what we usually use for patients who are further out from their Fontan, many years out. Uh, it is relatively straightforward for atrial pulmonary Fontans and lateral tunnel Fontans, where you can get directly from the venous circuit into atrial myocardium. Uh, but there's a lot less experience in the extracardiac Fontan for obvious reasons, and that is that the uh, conduit itself is, an, is a, an obstacle to getting to the atrial tissue from the venous system. 
Uh, we showed in 2014, this can be done though. So in 2014, we actually had a, a very unique case. We had a patient come to us from another hospital, very sick uh, with incessant SVT and underlying sinus node dysfunction. Every time we would uh, give her adenosine to convert her SVT, she'd go, she'd have junctional, severe junctional bradycardia and then go right back in SVT. She came to us uh, intubated, sedated, on dialysis, multiple pressors, and on uh, every form of antiarrhythmic drug uh, available and continue to have problems. And so we, it is, with no other option really, we took her to the cath lab and knowing that we can oftentimes pace and sense from the pulmonary artery for patients who have Fontan circulation, this is an extra cardiac Fontan by the way, Knowing that we could do that in the cath lab for EP studies, we decided to go ahead and try a screw in a lead into the pulmonary artery, externalize the lead, and do temporary external pacing uh, to sort of just improve the hemodynamics. We were able to do this. She actually did great, um, got off dialysis, was extubated, and weaned off her pressors in about a week. And so at that point, we thought, okay, let's rely on previous you know, literature and experience the interventional uh, um, world where uh, fenestrations are created between the PA and the, and the pulmonary venous atrium and take her back and plant a permanent pacemaker. So we actually uh, went ahead and mapped out the atrium first. We ablated her SVT, which was AV node reentry. And uh, you can see that there's a little blue dot up there in the appendage, which is where the prior um, surgical lead had been placed and had failed from the, just being dense scar in that area. So uh, at that point, um, uh, we basically punctured through the PA into the uh, left atrium there near the base of the left atrial appendage. You can see the contrast filling that there and uh, implanted a permanent lead um, in, the, um, in the left atrium with the um, lead tunnel down to an infraclavicular pocket. She actually did great. She went home about a week later uh, on Coumadin. Um, since then, um, we've thought, you know, you're leaving a lead, with that approach, you're leaving a lead in the left atrium, which is obviously a thromboembolic potential risk and uh, stroke risk. So we've modified the approach, and recently um, we thought, why don't we just go through the PA and put the lead into the epicardial surface of the left atrium, not actually enter the left atrium. And so recently we've done that, and um, this is the result. This is a patient who had severe sinus node dysfunction. Uh, had a failed epicardial lead, and you can see on levophase, that lead is now screwed into the uh, sort of the dome of the left atrium anteriorly, where we had excellent pacing and sensing characteristics. So that's um, <clears throat> sort of our current, one of the current approaches we have for, um, for transvenous pacing extracardiac fontans. Next major category is basically atrial flutter. Uh, this, um, uh, the incidence of this depends on the type of the fontan. So after atrial pulmonary fontans, classic fontans, uh, around a 50% incidence between 10 and 20 years out. It's less for the lateral tunnel fontans and lowest for the extracardiac fontans. And that's been shown more definitively lately and just in the last few years by the Australian New Zealand experience and then in this uh, meta-analysis that I had mentioned previously. Patients with, with um, fontan physiology do not tolerate atrial arrhythmias very well at all. They can rapidly develop tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy even without significantly elevated ventricular rates. This is a case we had. See the, the horrible ventricular function here on the left with severe AV valve, free AV valve regurgitation. And they also develop thrombus very quickly in the, uh, the fontan circulation, which is a real challenge in their management. Um, the, the, fortunately, the, um, the function is reversible with, uh, uh, with establishment of sinus, uh, fun, sinus node um, uh, rhythm. So um, management depends a little bit on the type of Fontan. Uh, for the atrial pulmonary Fontan, major uh, definitive therapy is going to be their catheter ablation or Fontan conversion. There's a separate, session, a separate talk on that later. Um, and then there's also the possibility of medical therapy. In general, antiarrhythmic drugs do not work well long-term for these patients, but it can be a, a, a valid temporizing measure. Uh, usually we're talking about reentry, so class three drugs like sotalol, defetilide, and amiodarone are the most useful in this population, but there's, there's a very high recurrence rate with antiarrhythmic drugs in these patients. Um, from a catheter ablation standpoint, these can be very challenging. Just the massive size of the right atrium and these classic right, atri right atrial PA Fontans creates the opportunity for multiple different reentrant circuits based on the uh, surgical history. This is one patient we've had over that uh, has had all of these different circuits at one time or another that will be mapped and ablated. Uh, it's important to remember the left AV valve and septal patch uh, as potential targets, the IVC circuit, and then the, uh, the PA anastomosis and SVC circuits as well. Um, the uh, targets, um, are oftentimes in the free wall of the right atrium, which can be very thickened uh, with longstanding atrial hypertension. And this has been shown wall thickness up to even almost a centimeter in thickness, um, which really challenges the limits of current ablation technology. 
Um, we do have uh, more advanced uh, mapping systems now. Ultra high definition mapping is available now so we can get to these targets much more uh, precisely than we have in the past and make much more focused catheter ablation lesions. And I think this is gonna ultimately lead to better outcomes in these patients. This is recently available. Um, I won't talk about Fontaine conversion too much just because it's coming up as another talk, uh, but uh, it is a, it's, a, it's a very good, well-established um, treatment for patients with atrial pulmonary Fontaine um, circulation. The lateral tunnel Fontaine uh, is one of the more modern versions. Uh, fortunately, from a catheter ablation standpoint, it's a little bit more easy to target circuits in these, these patients. Um, it's been shown basically most circuits are related to an atriotomy on the, in the lateral tunnel itself and also uh, between the uh, systemic AV valve annulus and the IVC. And those are the two most common targets. If it's the annulus uh, target, you may have to cross over the baffle to get there. The extracardiac Fontan is, is also a challenge, uh, mostly because just access getting to the pulmonary venous atrium is, can be challenging. We've shown previously that with early extracardiac Fontans in childhood, oftentimes there's an area of tissue overlap between the IVC and the, and the pulmonary venous atrium that develops very slowly with time. And this creates the opportunity to be able to puncture directly into the pulmonary venous atrium without having to go through the conduit. And so that's generally our preferred approach for targeting or for getting access to these uh, substrates. We also looked at the types of substrates in these patients in the setting of a multicenter study recently. And the major finding was that um, with primary, in other words, childhood extracardiac conduit Fontans, circuits tend to be quite simple around the AV valve annulus or around an atriotomy like we see with other forms of congenital heart disease. Whereas after conversion to an extracardiac Fontan with arrhythmia surgery, the, surges, uh, the circuits are much more complex and a little bit more challenging to uh, map and ablate. Next major category is uh, ventricular pacing and dyssynchrony. This is, um, becoming much more recognized as a, as a problem in the Fontan population. Um, if, you, if, we, if you have a patient who is pacing in the ventricle more than 40 to 50% of the time, they're at very high risk for progressive systemic ventricular dysfunction, AV valve regurgitation, and even death and transplantation. This has been shown very clearly now in a number of studies. It was first pointed out so actually, if you go back in the literature, it's back there in the 1980s even, but if, if the, the modern literature, Stanford and Ann Dubin have shown that in their patients who are paced more than 40% of the time, uh, all of these endpoints are much more commonly seen. And the recent um, combined population, New Zealand and Australia experience has shown that ventricular pacing, this is a recent study uh, that um, tra uh, transplant fleet survival is much worse with ventricular pacing. So what do we do about it? Um, there's not a lot out there actually on what the possible, what the sort of results of uh, interventions for this are. Uh, the, the major two uh, sort of approaches are either biventricular pacing or apical pacing. Um, Boston, the, this is a study out of Boston. Their preferred approach is biventricular pacing where they basically put the leads as far apart as possible and map out latest activation. And they've shown that um, Transplant-free survival with biventricular pacing is quite good as compared to single-site pacing. Um, they did point out that this p-value was only 0.08, so it wasn't significant. But I think if you look at these two curves, uh, we do see you see a nice separation between them uh, with biventricular pacing. Apical pacing, there's a lot less out there in the literature. There's only one study, and it's just uh, just released in press. Uh, from Japan showing uh, that apical pacing uh, it does, it actually was associated with lower BNP levels than non-apical pacing, but if you look at transplant-free survival, they did not see a difference. All oh, these are very small numbers, seven in one group and eight in another, uh, but no difference in transplant-free survival. And if you look at those, that kappa myograph on the right there, I don't like the way that looks as much as the other one. So the, the, um, but the word is still out. I don't think we really know what the best way to treat these patients is, although I think biventricular pacing probably is the way to go. This is a prefontan patient who had uh, single ventricle physiology. It was a polysplenia with um, AV block and had pretty severe dyssynchrony after single site pacing. Um, and so we took this patient back to the lab, uh, sorry, to the OR and had a mapping system in the OR. We mapped out latest activation and it was very high posterior basal uh, implanted the lead there. And then um, following this, we had a very nice um, systolic function with less, much less dyssynchrony. So I think uh, dual site pacing, mapping the latest activation is a good way to go for these patients, but we don't really know what the best um, approach is yet. Sudden cardiac death is a major problem. The incidence is only three to 5% at 10 years, but that's actually pretty high. 
Um, the potential mechanisms are multiple. It could include flutter with rapid conduction, uh, ventricular arrhythmias, proxismal AV block, or even, even thromboembolic complications. There's very little in terms of primary prevention strategies for the Fontan patient, in other words, predictors of sudden death. Um, the, the ones by the Mayo group are surgical AV valve repair, very high Fontan pressures in absence of sinus rhythm. Um, I wonder about the Sano shunt. There's no data yet, but uh, you know we're basically in these patients who are making ventriculotomies in the RV. And I think if you know if you look back at the tetralogy experience, that was prorhythmic in the long run. So we may be seeing uh, potential problems related to that in the future as well. Um, what do we do about it? You know, um, now that we have the subcutaneous ICD, I think this is probably the way to go for these patients, especially for secondary prevention. This is FDA approved in the U.S. in 2012. And, we've, uh, and this is how it's implanted. Basically, the pulse generator sits in the axilla, and there's a lead that's tunneled uh, along the sternum. It's completely subcutaneous. Nothing needs to go in the heart, uh, so it's very applicable to the Fontan patient. Um, the implant technique involves two incisions um, and, again, the, the axillary uh, device. We've previously studied this in, in um, congenital heart disease in general as part of the ARC network uh, multicenter collaboration. And... Um, the, uh, these devices were found to be safe and effective in the congenital heart population. I think just to, I want to point out here that the most common uh, congenital heart disease in this study was single ventricle, mostly Fontan patients. And I think that's because these patients really don't have any other good options for ICDs uh, at this point in time. So um, I think that's the, the, the key take-home point. So and to conclude, um, rhythm disturbances in the Fontan pop population are not well tolerated. They need to be aggressively targeted. Uh, junctional rhythm is, uh, is not well tolerated. It can be a potential therapeutic target for PLE. Um, flutter uh, is, um, uh, leads rapidly to tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, especially in the Fontan uh, population. Um, uh, Catheter ablation, mapping, and, and ablation techniques are improving. We're getting better at um, our approach to these patients. Ventric ventricular dyssynchrony is also a major cause of uh, Fontan failure. And, um, you know, I think that we don't know the best way to resynchronize these patients. However, I think biventricular pacing currently has the most uh, data to support it. Um, and finally, sudden death is not, not an insignificant problem. We need, to, we need better primary prevention predictors, uh, but we do have a good way to treat it with the SICD. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for your attention. Thank you.